Welcome to the Victims and Villains Podcast. This is the show where we sock nerd, we sock hope, and we speak nothing else. I'm your host, Captain Nostalgia, and on today's episode, we have a very special set of guests who just celebrated 150th episodes, and they're here to answer the age-old question, which is better, Nintendo 64 or the Sega Genesis? Please tell me in welcoming two of the best dudes that I ever met on the face of this planet, Anthony Rippo, Larry Mormon, Retro Gamers. And welcome to the Retro Gamers Podcast, episode 151. That's right, folks. If you haven't figured it out by now, we're pulling a hybrid. Larry here. And Anthony here. And Josh over there. And (laughs) And Josh over there eating a muffin. (laughs) Yeah, so uh, so we're here doing the hybrid episode with our boys over at Victims and Villains. Oh, boy. Over at Victims and Villains, uh, Josh. um, Always great to do these episodes. Yes, we're going to talk... Nintendo versus Sega, but and I mean I'm still reeling from episode 150. I mean it was it was a party. Yes, it was. <laughs> All right. Yes, end. That's for you, Frank. So, um, <laughs> so, so, so we've finally broken through. Uh, we're episode 151 now. Josh, of course. Um, you know, you were the one a that reminded us that we were hitting 150. So mm-hmm. thank you. I mean, yeah, congrats. Um, uh, yeah, it. my my brain my brain was like in another country, literally, and so uh, <laughs> it ju- I, it just didn't register. So we appreciate the sh- the, the shout out for that. No, no problem. Got to keep you guys accountable. Yeah. Oh, and just <laughs> so, a note, really quickly, you had mentioned in your open that uh, we're two of the best dudes you've ever met, and I just have to point out you haven't met that many people, have you? Oh, that is very accurate. No. <laughs> well, not the meeting part. Hold on, hold on, filler. Not the meeting part, but um, you know, we uh. I think Josh, you know, ever since, um, you know, Josh was, uh, uh, you know, granted, not granted, but gifted uh, a wonderful gift from the Retro Gamers, I feel like now he really, I think he's expecting more from us. And we're going to give him that in a wonderful episode, (laughs) Nintendo versus Sega, and I think we're going to have this one in the bag. Yep. All right. Thank you. (laughs) I'm hoping my my nostalgia kind of backs me up on this, so we'll, we'll see. You guys have way more energy than I do today. Sorry. <laughs> it is the time difference. I keep forgetting. My, the time. Yeah, yeah, no, I am complete. I am still jet lagged. I am absolutely <laughs> positively still jet lagged. <laughs> Sorry, we'll work through it. Josh, we're going to have to carry him. It's okay. Uh, all right. Sounds good. <laughs> so, um, so I guess let's get right into this. Um, you know, Sega, Nintendo, probably, you know, biggest battle since the Hatfields and the McCoys. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the 90s for video games was absolutely defined by these two. Uh, a lot of people may say Atari and, and Coleco or in television, throw all those in, but there wasn't that battle like there was with, with Nintendo and Sega, in my opinion. No, agreed. Absolutely. I mean, uh, Nintendo, uh, when Sega came around, um, you know, tried to compete in the marketplace. I mean, they were, the, they were pretty much the only ones that managed to take it to Nintendo um, you know, like, you know, just like, a, you know, tit for tat, basically, because the other, you know, all the other companies out there, they were, they had a piece of the marketplace, but it was never that big. Sega was the only one, I think, back then that was actually able to not only take a piece of the market, but take a sizable piece of the market um, from Nintendo. And, um, you know, uh, if anything, you know, they were, they were the uh, considerable threat to them for a while. Which is interesting as a whole, because you have... Sega, like, now basically was in its, like, height, whereas Nintendo has kind of kept going. It, they've proven their longevity with, you know, these great games and iconic characters, Legend of Zelda, uh, Mario, Donkey Kong. And Sega has really proven that in its heyday, like, they they were able to really bring the fight to them because you look at what genesis was able to offer as far as like a library and it has some really really fantastic games but in n64 has equally some of some of the best games ever set to cartridge you yeah. know with the and you're right uh, i agree with you on that one josh you know with the n64 uh definitely was in the 90s the, the the pinnacle of nintendo mostly because the 90s were ending um and that was the last system in that in that era um the genesis 
you know, I, we're going to talk N64, but I think the Genesis really went to battle with Super Nintendo and then, mm-hmm. well, the Genesis with Super Nintendo, the Dreamcast really with the N64 at that point. And, but with the two companies, period, oh, I hope you didn't hear that with the two companies, period, um, you know, it, it was, it was a battle of the ages and it really kind of, you know, it, it split it down the line. Were you a Nintendo guy? Were you a Sega guy? I know me and Anthony, obviously we were Nintendo guys. We had Sega uh, games, but, um, and I mean, do you remember really like, did you have any groups of friends uh, growing up who just were strictly Genesis? Um, strictly Sega? Yeah. I remember a couple of friends who did that and just, uh, also, bear in mind, before we... I know we're talking Genesis and Super Nintendo, because they were really the two that clashed head-to-head. Mm-hmm. But we also got to remember, you got to go back a little bit further than that, because in the 80s, we were actually talking about the original NES, which was uh, the main you know, entertainment console from Nintendo, and the Sega Master System, which predated the Sega Genesis. The Sega Master System didn't do as well as Nintendo, and the Sega Genesis came out actually in the 80s. It came out in 1989, and first started competing with the Nintendo. It took Nintendo two more years before they came out with the Super Nintendo in 1991. So Genesis, uh, or Sega, I should say, kind of had a leg up on the 16-bit competition because they wanted to get to market, you know, first, even though um, the Turbo Graphics actually beat them to the market, but that's a whole other story. Um, but yeah, I mean, I had friends who were Sega only. Um, and then at the end, to be honest with you, at the end of the day, no, really, there were no, there were no losers in that sense. They were just winners because Sega and Nintendo both had really awesome games. A lot of them had the same games um, because developers were putting games out on um, both systems. So it really, it really, to me, it didn't matter which one you had. It just depended on what your preference was. Now, granted, like you said, Larry, you know, two of us were Nintendo guys. And then, obviously, when you got past that point and Nintendo 64 came out before the Dreamcast, there was the Sega Saturn. The Sega Saturn was the first one to actually compete with the N64. So, stop me if I'm wrong, but... Stop. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, go. You set them up. So, the so the all right so you have the the genesis that came in late 80s two years prior before the super nintendo hitting 16 bits now the for those that may or may not know on the victim side the nes was an americanized version of the famicom from nintendo in the in the japanese market now would the super famicom have predated the the genesis or is it still coming out the same realm um i think well everything always came out over in japan first uh and correct me if i'm wrong i mean the 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 super famicom definitely would have come out slightly before the super nintendo the north american version Mm -hmm. i i don't remember how for maybe only a year back i don't remember the famicom coming out in 89 i don't know why 90s stick it in my head but i've been wrong numerous times no, the super uh, the Super Famicom, I believe, came out a little bit earlier. I want to say in 1990. All right, so it wasn't uh, that far off. Yeah. Uh, in fact, still... I'll pull I'll pull that up right now. November Close 21st, enough. 1990. There we go. While well, Anthony fact uh, checks that, um, so November 1990. So the over in Japan, you know, there wasn't much of a time difference, but over here, two years, definitely a long time, uh, especially back in the early 90s when be- pre internet. No one, you know, really, I know I never realized that even though these systems were made in Japan, I never put two and two together that there was, you know, games over there that may have been exclusive or come out before they came out over here. Um, But I think when we talk about the war, we could talk about, uh, you know, when this came out, when that came out, what predated what. But ultimately, it boils down to the actual gameplay, the games themselves and the systems. And I think, you know, that's the meat of what we would talk about. And Anthony said a lot of games came out on both systems. And I think that is one of the two in my head, one of the two criteria to really be able to to judge how good the system was when you put two games head to head that came out on both systems, but also at the same time, what exclusives the systems had. Mm-hmm. I think that's where it's going to lead. Now, Josh, let me ask you, because um, mm-hmm. obviously everyone knows uh, me and Ant are, are, are Nintendo. 
you know, growing up, what did you have? You know, what are you playing now? And what do you what do you even prefer now? So I actually own a so Genesis is one of the only two one of the two systems that I currently own. And I love to go back and play some of those. So a couple of weeks ago, we talked about Disney remastering those those games. And I love going back and replaying some of those old Disney games that they have. Uh, Toy Story is one of my favorite games to play on the Genesis. I love playing Aladdin, which is getting the remake and or the the reimagining. The re-release. Yeah. The re-release, yeah. Modernized version. And I I really enjoy those like those games and to me like n64 though it on the uh, on the opposite side from like growing up and going to like cousins houses and playing it like n64 had some of the best mario games had pokemon games it had some like really iconic games and then just even you know growing up now and being being an adult and going back and having the chance to play some of the games like it also had some super duds like Castlevania 64, Superman 64, <laughs> and like I think in a large part that kind of plays to the over complication of some of the the controls that some of those games had. Whereas with Genesis, you had a bit more of a simplified, you know, straightforward controller, and and so sometimes I think that the delivery of some of the some of the Genesis like gameplay was a bit more smoother on that ha- that behalf than what it than what it is. Like I I have I have a love for both, but it's for different aspects. But I think that if I had to uh, had to choose one, it would probably go with the Genesis, just simply because I have more nostalgic memories. I own one, I play it more often, and it just has that smoother gameplay. You know, you made some good points. It literally just dawned on me, and I think this is how we should approach this. Let's do this. I think if we we need to to break it down, like I said, but even, Josh, there was some parts in there you mentioned. I think we could break down even further. Let's start with this. Everyone can talk about the games, which we're going to talk about in a moment. Let's talk about innovation. And I'm talking, if, if I may, the life, you know, where Nintendo as a company is with their hardware versus Sega as a company with their hardware. Let's talk about the controllers, you know, the input. That's how you play the game. Nintendo constantly evolved. And the some of the controllers that came out for Sega, they were, you know, I'm not going to say weird, but they were definitely innovative as well. Anthony, who would you say maybe even had the best like longevity as far as these input devices, these controllers? You know, Nintendo came out with some weird ones as well. Yeah, Nintendo. Def- I mean, they both came out with some interesting ones and weird ones, and um, uh, we'll get to peripherals later too, because I think Sega definitely came out with more. I'm even that were strange- just talking first party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but um, I mean, the the thing that jumps out to me in terms of the, just controller wise is that, I've, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think Nintendo was the one who originated the L and the R button, um, which is being still, so. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. and that's still being used today. On you know pretty much every system, and not only that. Now you know we have L1, L2, R1, R2, basically on every system. And I really thought like that was um, that was a really interesting innovation because you know never before were they like, hey, you know what? Maybe players should use more than their thumbs when they play games. You know because it started you started accessing your index finger, and there was something really comfortable about using the L and the R buttons um, that just kind of enhanced the gameplay. So I really like I really think that. Um, that was a great move on Nintendo's part. And, uh, you know, and then obviously Sega answered back on that one with a six button controller when they started to come out with fighting games because, you know, Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat, things like that. But, you know, they had opted to just add a button to, you know, to the actual pad. So, in other words, like they didn't put the L and the R, they just had the six button controllers. Um, and then at the top, they had, a, a, you remember the mode button? <laughs> yeah. The mode button on the top right, yeah. and that's it. And I always felt like, that worked just fine, but there was something about the comfort level of the, those L and R buttons that uh, obviously we still use today. That that was pretty awesome. Yeah, I think that with the shoulder, obviously with the placement of the shoulder buttons, it makes it a little more comfortable. Uh, though in a fighting game, I did prefer, and I've gone on record saying I think like sh- like Mortal Kombat was better on Genesis. Um, just the way this, because the six buttons, as Anthony pointed out, were layer like three and three, um, no shoulders. So you know, I think. That aspect of it, 
um, worked out in in Genesis on a certain games. But yeah, the the how Nintendo is constantly evolving their controllers because look at all the systems. Usually, when a new system comes out, the controller looks somewhat the same. Well, PlayStation, it is the same, but they mm-hmm. always look a little of the same. Nintendo, every one of their systems, they go out. And, you know, when it got to GameCube, they're like, all right, I dare you to put as many buttons as you can on yep. one controller. <laughs> and they succeeded. Um, so Nintendo's always thinking that way. Yeah, and that's one thing that I, I love about Nintendo is that they are constantly evolving. And, like, Sega is one of those, because if I'm if I'm wrong, like, the Dreamcast controller was very reminiscent of the 64 controller, correct? Um. No, no, well, not in design. Nothing looks like the N64 controller. The N64 oh, yeah. controller looks like yeah, the like N64 controller is just the weirdest controller yeah. I've ever created. But it had its um, it had um, like it was the first one that had that. Remember the the memory card on a Dreamcast the basically VM. was a little yeah, it was a little system itself. It would it would show stats or it would show some sort of gameplay on it. And in the case of like a Sonic game, you can take the memory card out and play a uh, uh, Tamagotchi style game on the memory card separate from the system. Mm -hmm. So it was almost like the first second screen that we got in gaming, which was very innovative. The only annoying thing about the Dreamcast controller was that the wire stuck out from the bottom of the controller as opposed to the top. That was always odd. Well, it was also, it was also kind of a, I mean, no offense. I love my Sega Dreamcast and, you know, I still have it very happy with it. I was like, but that control, that controller to me was always a big blocky mess. It was just, it It was was like, Yeah, it was yeah. very bulky because when you were holding it, you were kind of holding it like this. It was just really, yeah. really huge. So, um, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, to to Larry's point, I mean, the VMU was definitely innovative at the time, uh, which was which was really cool and something I don't think we've seen since. I think I mean, was that correct me if I'm not, wrong? Yeah, not really. I mean, we get like a Xbox tried doing like a second screen, I think, like what, but with. Uh, smartphones, so they would try mm-hmm. incorporating that, but really, yeah, that that little memory card was the first of its kind, uh, and basically only. Uh, Josh, let me ask you this: When you play a game, like, are you looking for a game that really, like, style wise? Because Sega, I feel, went the route of trying to bring arcade games home, where Nintendo was basically just trying to create games for the home. Yeah, so you look at you look at Nintendo's library for the 64 and there's there's definitely a plethora of variety that you can choose from like it's you have your fighting games, you have your uh, horror games, you have your superhero games, like you have all of these games that for different genres so you're definitely appealing to more people whereas the variety for Genesis definitely exists but it's it's more geared towards the arcade crowd where you have even some of the even some of the the way that the the movie games like Aladdin and Lion King and Toy Story even the way that some of those handled they handle very much like arcade controllers they they have that two dimensionality with it and i i think for for like a true gamer like you're going to find joy in anything but i think that Genesis kind of offers that experience a little bit better whereas n64 was kind of something that you had uh its games were basically something that to appeal to everyone so it was a game that you could definitely break out in a party in a sleepover in whatever and you look at what nintendo would go on to do with the wii bringing like a very uh developing a very family driven system i think you see some of the early blueprints for that in the n64 where they're trying to bring games home and they're trying to bring games together that are going to unify and you have these really good iconic games like mario racing um i'm trying to think of other ones mario party mario party like you have games like that then you also have golden eye then you also (laughs) also have games like uh like perfect dark which is, you know, gearing yep. towards more like horror based and definitely trying to create that sense of, uh, you know, just adventure and trying to take the trying to take the the system into like new areas. And then also adding on uh, there was another Castlevania game released outside of 64, correct? There, there was. was they tried correcting I, on on 
N64, there was they tried correcting basically Castlevania 64. Uh, mm-hmm. I forgot the, I forgot the the subtitle for it. But um, you know, going back to the party aspect and I mean, you know, we've known each other for what, 25 years now. Remember I mean the N64 was everyone would come over. Me, you, Anthony Chu, the Yin and the Yang podcast. You're welcome. And you know, a bunch of our other friends and we would play on the N64. Forget about the WWE games, Mario Party games, yeah. uh, all these multiplayer games. And let me ask you, do you think Nintendo had the edge on multiplayer <laughs> games as opposed to Sega and their systems? Um, well, I think there was no question that Nintendo actually had the advantage. I mean, first off, the system came out with four controller ports, so they immediately, it was immediately known that, um, they were planning on this to be a multiplayer system, whereas... First system, I think, that did that. Uh, I I believe so, you are correct, yeah, Yeah. because every other system, um, every Sega system, uh, um, actually through all of their life cycles were only two, two ports. You would have to buy the, um, the multiplayer adapter if you wanted to have a that. Was it Dreamcast? Dreamcast? Okay, my mistake. The Dreamcast. It was also the last one. So it was the last one. Um, But yeah, but Nintendo um, with yeah with the sixty four, they definitely were planning on the multiplayer. And to your point, um, we would have you know we would have um, we would just have four player games like nonstop with our friends and everything like that. You know, I have I have really great memories of all three of my friends ganging up on me in every game I ever played with them because they just didn't like the fact that I won all the time. If the if if live streaming was a thing in the late 90s, the amount of times you would watch Anthony rage quit a game because yep. maybe we wanted to get him out of the Royal Rumble or try to beat him in a game. And and the disrespect that we had doing it in his own house, because we always gathered at Anthony's house, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> it, it would have been a sight to behold and we would have ruled the Internet. That's actually very true. There would have been a lot of viral videos of me being very angry. <laughs> I mean, you could recreate some of those, like, just saying. Oh, I think we will. <laughs> I think we will. <laughs> I think, yeah, that, that's that's coming coming soon to Twitch. Um. <laughs> um, but, you know, and and that, I think, where Nintendo leads to it. But Genesis, uh, not Genesis, I say Genesis, but Sega. You know, I am going to give the edge to Sega for bringing that um arcade style gaming yes. to the home even on the genesis like the double dragon games were basically a- almost a direct port of the arcade um josh did you ever get a chance to really play the game um uh dreamcast i did not so okay. i don't i don't unfortunately don't know but uh you know to to your point about you bringing the arcade home mm-hmm. one of the games that i do own is mortal kombat 2 so, like, yeah, when you play yes. Mortal Kombat 2, like, Mortal Kombat 2 feels like you're stepping into an arcade setting right in the comfort of your own home, which I think I, I think was innovative. And I, I still think it, it's today is, like, if you want to go back and, and be nostalgic, then it's, a really, it's really great for, for that purpose. And I think that the N64 has a whole set of other nostalgia memories, but as far as like bringing the arcade into the home, that's definitely an edge to Genesis. Yeah, there's no question about that. And I think um, one of the things you have to bring up when you when you when you call out the Genesis, if you want to talk about bringing the arcade home, the very first pack-in game for the Sega Genesis was Altered Beast. Let's not forget that, and yes. that was a direct port from. Um, from the arcade game, which I remember I used to play that in my pizzeria around the corner, like all the time <laughs> I would go there. They had, they had, two arc- <laughs> they had two arcade games. One of them was Altered Beast. Oh, good old Prontos. Yeah, which was, <laughs> and then, you know, just to touch on, you had mentioned the Dreamcast. Uh, let's not forget also one of the greatest fighting games ever created that was ported to the Dreamcast, which was Marvel vs. Capcom 2. Oh, the definitive, definitive game. I only had it on the PlayStation, mm-hmm. uh, Marvel's Capcom 2, and on the PlayStation it was only two on two, but the Dreamcast yep. got it to three on three. Yep. Nowadays, it goes for a lot of money, so forget about it. Um, yep. And I definitely got my butt handed to me in that game on PlayStation more often than not in college. Um, you know, we talk, we're talking a lot here, uh, you know, Super Nintendo, N64, we mentioned the GameCube, um, you know, Genesis, Dreamcast. I think where another thing I want to hear you guys weigh in on this, where Nintendo has it over Sega, is that 
we're not really mentioning the Saturn. So Nintendo has consistency with mm -hmm. their systems where, uh, I mean, it eventually led to Sega where the Dreamcast became the last system that they put out, mm -hmm. but they even had the Nomad, you know, uh, the Game Gear and stuff like that. Sega CD. You know, exactly. So Nintendo has more memorability. Memorability? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, then, like, then, then Sega does, in my opinion, because Sega was kind of hit and miss with their system. I don't remember anyone having a Master System growing up. Uh, I had one friend that had a Master System growing up, and I remember going over there and playing like uh, a handful of games there, like Road Rash and um, mm -hmm. Alex Kidd and stuff like that. And it was, it was a, there was nothing wrong with the system. I liked the system. Uh, the only, the only thing was, you know, obviously I had a Nintendo, so yeah. You know, and at that time, you know, I'm I'm a kid. I can't get a system whenever I want like I can now um, because, you know, mom and dad had to buy them. And what was the point <laughs> of having more than one system at a time in your house? Um, because, you know, that we that's what you got. Like 12. <laughs> yeah. No, that I, doesn't exist now. I was going to say, I was gonna say <laughs> now I have 25. I was like, but back then, you get one. <laughs> So, you know, like when you think Josh, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say like what like when you think of gaming, like what do you go to, Nintendo or Sega? I think that I think Nintendo has the the more vast and iconic library because you look at something like you look at something like NES and the NES Classic that came out a couple years ago, you look at what a cultural just iconic storm that was when it hit stores and you then the same with the the Super SNES and the <laughs> I did it on purpose. <laughs> Damn it, I thought I walked away for victims and villains. <laughs> then the, but then you look at, you know, you look at the N64, you look at Game Boy, you look at uh, you know, that's that's another thing too, is like, you know, the the handheld market, you know, mm -hmm. you have the Game Gear versus the 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 Game Boy and all the variations that have come on the Game Boy, like for for Genesis, I think hit its height at at Gen or Sega hit its height at Genesis, whereas Nintendo kept reinventing itself. It felt almost kind of like every system was something for a new audience or something for a new crowd. To where you you had the sixty four, but then you went to the GameCube, then you went to the Wii, then you went to the the switch like they're they're constantly reinventing themselves and saying okay this is what we've done before how can we take what we've done before repeat it but completely reinvent it at the same time and i think that's one of the things that like you guys had said in the past like all of these other systems constantly kind of stay the same they're all third party but nintendo is kind of just over here quietly doing its own thing and i think that's that's the reason why that we're seeing the switch have the longevity that it's had i don't think that when they when in 20 years from now when we're talking about other systems i think you know this generation you have was it playstation 4 and yep. and uh, xbox one like i think yep. that the I think the Switch is going to be a heavy competitor to come up against that and maybe even be the better system of the current generation that we have now just because of its in, uh, innovative like foraging. Yeah, and innovation is always something Nintendo's been doing, but I think one of the mo more important things to look at when you look at Nintendo is the fact that they, as a company, we looking at them as a company as opposed to Sega uh, and all the other companies out there, but... I feel like Nintendo never ever looked at themselves as a competitive system to everybody else. They have their business plan. They've always stuck to their business plan, and they've and they have their processes and protocols that they follow. And never in there does it do they ever look like they're trying to compete with the other companies. They're just there doing their own thing. And again. Uh, something you bring up, the power of their first party games is what's always carried them throughout um all of their life cycles and uh, and and they're perfectly fine with that like when they came out when they came out with the switch they knew that their the switch wasn't going to be as powerful as the ps4 as powerful as the xbox one but they you know they released it anyway because they knew exactly what they were doing according to their plan they're like we know what we want to make we know what our with our audience wants 
and that's it. And that's what they focus on. And that's the reason why I always feel like they're successful. Are they as successful as Sony and Microsoft? No, they're not. But are they okay with that? Yes. And that's why they continue, you know, to succeed. The only time where they almost faltered was with the GameCube. And this was another point I wanted to bring up while you were talking about this stuff, because you talked about third party. And I think this is what ultimate this is what wound up ultimately dooming Sega is because Sega's first party library wasn't particularly strong. To your point, mm -hmm. they would import arcade games. They would release a lot of games with like celebrity tie-ins. If you think about all this, like um, uh, Joe Montana football, uh, Evander Holyfield boxing, like they they went out and they got you know a lot of stars to be in their games. But a lot of a lot of their power was from third party. And when the third party started to leave them. Um, around the time of the Sega Saturn and the Sega Dreamcast. that To me, that's one of the major factors of what ultimately sunk them because they didn't have a strong enough they didn't have strong enough first party material to keep their systems afloat. Sony in the mean you know Sony meanwhile, you know when the PlayStation came out, had a ton of third party games and that's what kind of helped them succeed. Nintendo, on the other hand, almost wound up sinking with the GameCube for the same thing. They didn't. They they did not have third party support on the GameCube. While at the same time, they actually didn't have enough first party support on the GameCube. And for a while there, um, there were talks of Nintendo not putting out systems after the GameCube. So it was you know there there was actually a time when Nintendo <clears throat> could have gone the route of Sega almost around the same time. So um, yeah, yeah, and that would have been weird. I would like a world without a Nintendo system. I mean, it was still weird with a world without a Sega system, yeah. but, and it's, you know, and you look back on it, you know, history always tends to justify things. And, you know, history I think is justifying the GameCube because in my opinion, the GameCube is an extremely underrated system. The games that came out on it were awesome. Uh, but yes, they suffered first party and third party. Shockingly, uh, yeah. you would think only one, two, one, I think one Mario game, really came out on the GameCube, Super Mario Sunshine, um, yep. which, again, is a good game, but no one really gives it credit. Yeah, but... You um, know, it, it, oh, I love that game. The, yeah, as I was say, it's game. the power of the <laughs> launch titles, though. Also, you got to remember, like, I think mm -hmm. when GameCube came out, correct me if I'm wrong, it was, the, it was the first Nintendo system to come out without a Mario launch title. It also did not have a Zelda launch title, which were the, you I know, don't remember what the launch title was. Did it even uh, have a launch title? I don't think it did. Well, oh, wait, when you say launch title, hold on. You're not talking about a pack-in game. You're talking about games that came out at the same time. Games that came out with the release. Okay, of, all right, all right. I believe Luigi's Mansion was the launch oh, title. Oh, God, it, yes. How could yeah, I forget? Yeah, it was. Duh. Yeah. Shame but, on me. It was, but again, it was unprecedented for Nintendo, and you know, and nothing against Luigi's Mansion. It's a great game. But I thought that was a major misstep with the GameCube because, and again, it took them a while before a Mario game came out. It also took them a while before, you know, Wind Waker came out. So... And the you know your system the the power of your system is going to be judged by how well it does at launch because it's hard to make it it's hard to make it up afterwards. Um, it's the reason why Sony did so well with the PlayStation because when the PlayStation came out at launch with their library, it did phenomenally well, um, and the rest is history. Whereas you know when Sega Dreamcast came out, I mean Sonic Adventure, amazing game, Fantastic. absolutely amazing game on the Dreamcast. I love that game. Um, yep. But there was just not an, there wasn't enough meat outside of that to really carry the system. And, I think, and then they try. Yeah, go ahead, Josh. I'm sorry. I was going to say, like you even thinking like, you know, we've had how many different variations of like the Sega classic and it's not worth the money because you don't have that first party uh, iconic status or or replayability that a lot of them have i think when you think of the the genesis as far as the really fantastic first first parties you have a couple uh, and and most of them are sonic titles whereas with nintendo you have all this first party legend of zelda you have uh, mario pokemon you know the there's just so many variety but there's so much they're so iconic now and and even in it's it's the the midst of this war they they still held that high iconic status better and that's the reason why you're able to go back and replay those games is because not only are they iconic but they are phenomenal games they are some of the best games ever set to cartridge like i had previously said 
Uh, yeah, and you know, to your point as well, now that we're getting into the world of the minis, NES mini, Super NES, TurboGrafx coming out March of 2020. Um, when this episode dropped, I have my Sega Genesis Mini somewhere. I don't know. But, um, you know, the Sega Genesis Mini, the proper Sega Genesis Mini, because you mentioned, Josh, a bunch of them came out. That was just more the fault of just, they were just faulty systems. Uh, this one's being made by Sega. Uh, but now in this world of these minis and people hitting that nostalgia, um, you know, it's almost like the war is going to slowly start coming back. I mean, it's 2009. No, excuse me. By the time it comes out, it's going to be 2020. And again, we're going to have in the, like in the minis, people are already talking about the turbo graphic 16 mini. They're going to have the Sega Genesis mini. We have on the switch, the NES and the SNES libraries, who knows if they'll do the N64 at that point. Um, and, uh, yes. And, um, you know, it's cause that actually, I think is going to come up on our, on our feed. So, <laughs> so yes, there is a unicorn. Oh, there it is right there. Yep, new day. Um, so yeah, I think, I think we may actually be entering into the second phase, the, the, um, the empire strikes back, if you will, of the console wars. I mean, at this would be very sad then, I guess. I think at this point, though, Nintendo's already won before it's even over because yeah, well, Mar well, well, like here, just hear me out. Like, for to kind of put it in like terms that I think victims listeners will understand is yeah. you have here you have Nintendo. Nintendo is basically the equivalent of Marvel and the cinematic universe that they created. And what is it now? Four or five years later, then you have DC that comes along, or in this case, Sega that says, "Oh." I want to get on this nostalgia train. Let me just let me just put together the system and then ship it out. And I I think that I think that all of the copycat Sega minis or Genesis minis, whatever they're calling them, I think that that hype has just kind of been died down because I remember when I first came across the one from it and I sent it to to Anthony. I was like, this is this sounds amazing. And then he was like, oh no, it's not worth your time. It's not worth your money. It's it's utter garbage and I, I think that that is going to kind of put a a damper in their sales whereas again with the the nes classic like that was that was something that was innovative like here you have this system that you can literally just plug into your tv hd all these games remastered built right into it flat rate that's that's innovative and now you have all these other systems that are trying to kind of take that steam and bring it to their own table you know, real quick, I just want to say, so Nintendo's Marvel, Sega is DC. Does that mean TurboGrafx is Sony, and that's why Bonk is never going to be seen on the Nintendo system again? Yes. 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 Okay, just checking. Um, so, and I mean, do you have any... Uh-oh. What? I think we, we got reverb, hearing some reverb you know. on, your, on your end. Had it all of a sudden, just out of nowhere? Yeah. Maybe. Oh, no, it's gone. It's gone. All right, we're back. We're back. Uh, okay. We never cut. Uh, so, yeah, and your point to that. No, I mean, my point to that was um, actually, um, yeah, Josh, Nintendo definitely, definitely hit a home run when they came out with their minis. But before that, um, before, before that, Genesis actually did have several minis in the market. And who's to say if Nintendo decided to do it in response to that? But to your point... It's the power in the companies that you sign, and when Sega signed with At Games, At Games was the one who put out all those original minis that were that were poorly done. Um, it was the poor quality on their part that led to them, you know, being reviled. So, um, so is it Sega's fault necessarily? Not too sure, because once you sign a contract, you sign a contract. They obviously had faith in At Games, and At Games essentially kind of let them down. So and there were definitely. And not, yeah, and not to mention the fact that there were a slew of other, you know, there were a slew of other um, flashback consoles that were coming out. There was the Atari flashback and television flashback. They had a whole bunch of other ones before the NES Mini came out. So, but what Nintendo did show everybody is this is this is how you do it right. And now Sega has come along, and I'm assuming what they did was, and again, this is all. This is like the business part in the background that most people don't realize because it's like, well, how come Sega didn't put out, you know, a good Genesis, you know, Genesis Mini Classic or anything like that? You got to wait for the contract to run out. And I'm assuming as soon as their At Games contract ran out, they were like, okay, great. Now we can go make a yeah. good system with a better company, which is what the, you know, 
the Genesis and Mega Drive Mini is going to be um, when it releases later this month. At least that's, that's fair. Yeah, I think that's to my assessment. That's fair. I didn't even kind of really consider the the business aspect of it because. You know, with with the the at games contract, you got to imagine that like, it, it probably wasn't just for a one off. It was probably for a couple of years. Yeah. And so that's that's a really good point. And yeah. I think they released. That, I was going to say they re released that many so many times yeah. with at games. And remember, it also the selling point to it was the fact that it played Genesis games like the new one that's coming out. It's yeah. not going to play Genesis. It's going to like all the other ones. It's going to be preloaded yeah. and that's it. But at games, and I bought one. Look, I was, I was oh, sweet. This is awesome. And it's kind of like a new Genesis system. But it was the hardware that just yeah. did not do that justice. Exactly. And not only that, it said, oh, it's loaded with eight, preloaded with 80 games. Yeah. 30 of them were Genesis games. The rest were all homebrews. Yeah. So, and on top of that, yeah. And on top of that, to your point, like they kept coming out with new ones over and over again. I don't think that was necessarily on Sega's part. That was on at games part. They were trying to milk. The contract I don't blame Sega at all. Yeah, they were just trying to milk it. They were like, Let me, let's make as much money as we can since we have the license for Sega games. And so they just kept coming out with different versions over and over and over again, trying to be like, all right, everybody, buy this one. We swear it's better. Um, and it just wasn't. No. I, I, I've I never played it, but from like, you know, I would rather spend the $60 on a, or however much it was on a, on a refurbished system and some games because... Mm -hmm. I know that at that point I'm going to get to play the games that I want to play. And that's kind of something that that held me off from wanting to play the PlayStation Classic was because while I love the PlayStation 1, none of the games that they had on it were were something that I wanted to pay for. It's like, well, I mean, had it come with something like Tomb Raider or Gex or Spyro, like, you know, these games that I felt like really defined the system for me, I would have thrown down the money then. But like, it's just kind of one of those things that it uh, I think the reason why <clears throat> Nintendo has the those better systems and those better uh, the better games is was just because they had a better library for games. Well, a better first party library. That's the thing yes. to keep in mind when the PlayStation Classic came out. You got to remember all those Sony PlayStation games that you loved, and we talked about this earlier. The power of the third party and paying those licensing fees on Sony's part to put those games on the classic wasn't worth the cost because, again, by, at the end of the day, they wouldn't have made as much of a profit, if any profit, off of the system, the, the classic system, had they, you know, had they had to pay all of those third party licensing fees. And, and this is where, and we, again, we've talked about it on, on retro gamers This is where I disagree politely with Anthony. Whereas a lot of the, look on any of these mini systems, no one is ever going to agree that the entire lineup is great. There's always going to be a game that you wanted on there. That's missing or a game on there that you don't want to see that with, with that being said, I feel the reason why you don't see symphony of the night, tomb Raider, Spyro crash. Yeah. Crash. On the mini, on the PlayStation Mini, I can remember if it was on there or not, is because short of Tomb Raider, Tomb Raider is the only one that I will give, like, you know what? That should have been on the system. Mm -hmm. But Spyro, Crash, and Symphony of the Night were just re released on the modern consoles around that time in different, you know, different bundle packs. So, you know, why immediately then put it out on the mini when, you know, half, if not three quarters of these people already own. A Xbox probably in a PlayStation and they'll get those games on that again that's my opinion I'm yeah. not saying that's fact um, right. and, and, but and, yeah I was just to say just a quick counterpoint to it you know Nintendo makes it a habit of selling you the same game over and over and over again mm -hmm. by the time the NES mini came out how many times have you purchased Super Mario Brothers Super Mario Brothers 3 Legend yep. of Zelda I mean a good 10, at least 10 of the games on that system, you've probably bought several times over the course of your life. So, frankly, it didn't stop them. It shouldn't have stopped Sony to do that, especially if they were release, even if they were releasing them on their PS4 and everything like that. For the nostalgia factor and the appeal to what made the Sony PlayStation such a great success, they should have definitely, um, they should have definitely put those on the but, class. 
here's the thing though though you mentioned first party games on nintendo of course you know that they're going to re-release their own the you know the games i'm talking about are mostly third party so mm -hmm. the third party aspect says you know what we can get more money if we just sell it as the the crash bandicoot triple pack or the spiral triple pack that's right. coming out or the rondo of blood two pack um again well, yeah, i feel like that's, that's what, what that is yeah yep. that's what i said licensing so, always comes into play here but no, i think no, no, I'm too saying, it, yeah I was going to say is like, you know, uh, I've talked to you guys uh, several times individually off off the record and <clears throat> off recording. And you you look at how much, you know, every system that comes out, you know, whether it has been PlayStation, Xbox, Sega, mobile, Nintendo, there's they always have these digital stores. And a lot of these classic games you can now buy on digital stores. You've been able to do that for for years. And. But I think that there's something about being able to play it on the system that it was created for. The system like Nintendo or or Sega or PlayStation 1, like there's just something that goes hand in hand for that. It's like if I gave you guys a Sega Genesis that was filled, preloaded with all of these arcade ports, would you rather play that or the original arcade machine? You know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. And that's going to boil back down to the controller. You know, it's why Nintendo, you know, Nintendo released, uh, it's already available on the Switch, the Super NES lineup. And they're selling separate. And you can play it with a Joy-Con. Absolutely no problem. We talked about it last week on episode 150 of the Retro Gamers podcast, how you can play <laughs> the Super NES games now on the Switch. But they're selling a Super NES controller, because you're right, Josh, to your point, there's nothing like A, on the original system, but even B, with the control, the designed controller that the game was meant for. Like, if they do an N64 lineup next year on the Switch, they had best be releasing an N64 controller, um, which I think would be awesome on the side point, but... You know, I think it boils down to that. You're right. Familiar, familiar. My head's going to explode. Familiar. Uh, yep. So the sameness of having the uh, controller, you know, with the game. Yeah, and it's I got, on a different system. Yeah, as I say, no, and I have to agree with that as well. I mean, there's not um, uh, as um, as great as it is playing the games on the original console or in the you know the original style. The controller has as much value as playing the game because it's that. Um, it's that it's that not only the nostalgic feel of it, but the comfortable feel of it, because muscle memory is a big thing. So when you're sitting there playing the game, uh, when I'm playing any game, even when like I'm on my, you know, when I'm on my uh, PS4, I have some I have some retro games on there that I've downloaded off the library. It doesn't feel the same playing mm -hmm. it on a PlayStation controller. I do yearn for that um, for the original controller when I play games. It's also why I to kept that... every system <laughs> to that point. Well, <laughs> You weren't around for Hurricane Sandy. So, when this is true. like, speaking of which, like, for the Wii, when the Wii came out, that introduced the virtual console. And at the time, you know, you, you know, probably around that time, I don't think the nostalgia factor was really fully into play yet, to the point where people were still collecting, collecting, not keeping, but collecting the old systems again. So I remember when the virtual console came out, I, I was downloading everything. I'm like, sweet, I can finally play, you know, Super Mario Brothers again. And yes. You can use the Wii controller sideways, as we have a guest now on the, on the Retro Gamers okay. podcast. Snow wants to be part of the show, okay? Hello, Snow. Hey, Snow. Hi. Oh, Snow's going to kill somebody. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, you can use the Wii remote sideways, and that kind of gave you a feel. But it wasn't until years later when the NES Mini came out, and you're able to plug the NES controller for the mini into the wii and use that to play the virtual console and i got to admit as weird as it sounds it i started playing more of the virtual console because i had the nes and subsequently the super nes controllers because it had that same dongle so can i can, all right let me take this let me take this as a we're kind of winding down let me take this in a direction i think you know we've talked about the success we've talked about the longevity but you know you fail to also under both companies had it's blunders and it's it's failures and it, being innovative most notably you know you have the uh on one hand you have the oh man what is what is the well, what is this what's failures this, for an what's the, what you trying to hold josh in your hand the, uh sega sega what is what is uh the genesis game gear, game game, gear? no saturn not, 
Gain Akino. Dreamcast. Uh, Game Gear Saturn. Dreamcast. Dreamcast. Nomad. Oh, Dreamcast. I want to have. I want to have you have Dreamcast that kind of a, uh, you know, basically shut the doors on Sega's console yeah, base. Yeah. But then you also have the the Master System, the Sega CD, Game Gear, all of these systems that aren't as iconic as the the um, Game Boy, the Genesis, and yeah. and Game Boy and other competitors. And then on the I other see. hand, you also have Nintendo has the Virtual Boy. So, all right, all right, all right. Look, look, look. We don't have to go in that direction, okay? Yeah, you know, we 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 almost made it the entire the entire discussion without talking about the disaster <laughs> that was the Virtual Boy. Um, now, yes, for 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 all of Sega's missteps, the 32X, which didn't do well, the Sega CD, which didn't do well, um, the Nomad, which also did not do well. They they, they didn't even come close oh, to the mark. absolute yeah. trash bag that was the Virtual Boy. <laughs> But you also Sega also you know not Sega but Nintendo also had the the GameCube which wasn't it really wasn't as revered as it was like you guys had just talked about like it's a very underappreciated system but at the same time I think that you know as much as Dreamcast is also unappreciated I'm sorry Larry, lost... uh, Larry, we we have to acknowledge that Larry is putting up like, these garbage games uh, all virtual boy games so, fantastic yeah. uh, but you know at the Gosh, same time it, it I was gonna say like you know which one which one has the biggest failures and and are they truly considered failures because you know maybe they weren't they were ahead of its time mm. here i don't honestly and i'm not trying to be like oh let's all be nice and cheery and everything but i don't think really there aren't any failures that doomed either company because they're both still around both companies still here as much as sega isn't doing hardware anymore they're still pumping out software that yeah. is fantastic you know there's still mm -hmm. many sonic games sonic mania came out a year or two yep. ago that is phenomenal so you know as much as yeah they got out of the hardware business you know they're technically kind of back in it with the mini but as much as they got out of the hardware business they still thrived which they did originally the hardware is just is what put it on the tv it was their games that really made sega and it's showing today nintendo on the other hand since they were basically all in house, and yes, there were some failures. Look, let's let's call it like it is. the The Virtual Boy, what the idea of the Virtual Boy was great, innovative, innovative, yes. absolutely. You know, again, the idea was great. the uh, The execution of it, yeah, not so much. Uh, but look, you can't. You got to try. You can't just. You're not going to make it. A business isn't going to make it if they're not going to try, at least. And Nintendo is proven, like you said, with the Virtual Boy, with the Game uh, 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 GameCube, um, even with the Wii U, which wasn't that selling that good. They still try. They still went for it, but they kept moving forward, and that's what it's all about. Yeah, and I think, um, well, uh, Larry makes some good points there. Uh, I would say, like, if we're talking about the console business. Um, there's no question that Sega had more failures. There's a reason why they got out of the hardware business. They, you know, at least, or not even the hardware business, but the home console business. Their hardware business is doing perfectly fine. It's just not doing as well here as it is elsewhere. Because when I go to Japan and um, I'm traveling around there, they, um, there are more physical Sega locations where you can go and play arcades basically you know there, there are a lot more arcades in japan you know between osaka and tokyo tokyo more so um but when i'm walking around there there are two companies that i always see um that have literally physical establishments multi-level arcades like we're talking four and five four or five floors worth of an arcade and inside each one of them there are like five to ten of the same game and packed with people and the two companies are Namco Bandai uh, Namco Bandai I got that backwards Namco Bandai and Sega and so their hard, their hardware business is perfectly fine when you look at it from that front when it came to the home consoles yeah Sega faltered and again I really do believe a big part of that was again first party titles weren't as strong and they didn't have a lot of third party support Toward you know when the Saturn and the Dreamcast came out because I'll be perfectly honest with you, the Dreamcast definitely had a leg up on the Sony PlayStation and the N sixty four. It was a lot more powerful system. Again, they were they were coming out with 
some decent games. And on top of that, it was the first real system in the U.S. to incorporate the Internet. You were actually able to really go online, and that was going to be a major selling point for it. The problem was they did not have a library to sustain it. And that's where they re that's really what drove them out of the business. Um, so if I had to say which one had more failures, I would definitely say Sega. But I wouldn't. But to Larry's point, it, it it's not like it sunk the company. The company no. is doing just fine. And it's it's also kind of like it's gauging in different directions because, you know, just because we don't really, I guess, like no but like sega doesn't really know success in the states doesn't mean that there is not elsewhere yep. and to know that like there are like floods of people that are gathering around cabinets to play their machines like that's that's an that's a success that you know i think i would i would ultimately give to sega because you know getting together on like a friday night to go to an arcade and physically you know be active and you know, you not only are you presenting like health at that point, but you're also presenting community. And I think that that's a more vital to the gaming experience than saying, oh, hey, let's go grab a, a, a cold one and go play the newest Mario game. Like to me, I think that that's that is where Sega wins, whereas, you know, they've they've been innovative, I think, in, in different respects and different regards. Exactly. And, you know, I agree. And and, you know, and that and that's the same with Nintendo as well, because if you um, I mean, granted, we all we all know Nintendo for what it is today. But if you you know, if you know Nintendo's history, the company is almost 130 years old. They did not start with video games. They were a trading card company that was established in 1889. Yep. So, I mean, we're yeah. talking. Uh, so it's it's actually celebrating its 130th year. Um according to my Wikipedia page that I have up right here, um, in a couple of weeks, September 23rd, is their 130th year in business. So, again, we know them for who they are now, but again, we did not know the company that, you know, where when it began, how it built and everything like that. And it's the same thing today, where Nintendo makes all of their money now in video games, so does Sega, but, you know, again, it all depends on where you are and what you're doing uh, in terms and of what your interests are. And to wrap this up, you know, Josh, next time you're in New York City, all right, let me know. And another, you know, as much as Sega's all over Japan, I will bring you to the Nintendo store in New York City. There's no Sega store, but I'll bring you to the Nintendo store in New York City, and we'll check that out. Uh, let you know the next time that I'm I'm up in the city. Bro, I'm going to be crashing on your floor the next time I'm in your city. We will be talking. <laughs> <laughs> there is a Motel 6 about an hour and a half. No, I'm kidding. Um, but, you know, oh, be that as... <laughs> so, you know, with uh, wrapping this up here on a wonderful hybrid episode... Well, um, before And before yeah. you wrap it up, Larry, because I just... I, I didn't get a chance to bring this up earlier, but since we've been talking... Uh, about Sega versus Nintendo, yeah. I just want to I want to do a call back to um, a book that I read probably last year, and we talked about it on the show, and we've talked about it before. But for anybody who is interested in learning more about the heated Sega Nintendo you know battle back in the early '90s with the Genesis and the Super Nintendo specifically, um, Blake J. Harris released a book called Console Wars, and I highly yes. recommend if you really want to see what went down. Give this a read. It's absolutely excellent. And it really gives you a good... The, I mean, Harris really did a good job of mining all of the information from the actual Sega employees. Nintendo, not so much because they're not... No, they're not very forthcoming. With no, they're not. Their information is very all. guarded. But he gets firsthand accounts from the people who made the Sega Genesis the success that it was. So you get a lot of information um in regards to the history of um of the of the console wars between sega and nintendo awesome. so i strongly recommend um reading that book when also, you get into console wars also on that front they are it is also being optioned out for a movie and if yes. i remember correctly it is supposed to be from the producers of the boys cool oh that I didn't would hear be about awesome. that i thought uh what's this i thought uh seth i thought seth rogan had something to do with that Seth not. Rogen is a producer of The Boys. Oh, is he? I didn't realize that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, and, and, oh, and well, preacher. there you go. Yep. Doesn't surprise me. Seth Rogen actually wrote the forward for this book. Oh, so. well, all right. Well, that just put two and two together. There you go. There you go. And on that note. All right.
Well, uh, where can people find you guys? Nowhere. Uh, <laughs> anywhere you listen to podcasts, check out the Retro Gamers podcast, specifically Apple iTunes, uh, Apple Podcasts, excuse me, Spreaker, uh, Podcoin, and anywhere else you listen. Uh, and they can find us on social media as well. Yeah, um, you can find us on uh, theretrogamers.com if you still look up traditional websites. Uh, or you can find us on Facebook. Uh, Facebook is our, you know, where we put most of our, you know, all of our information, facebook.com slash retrogamerspodcast. Um, Instagram at retrogamerspodcast. Uh, we are also, um, let's see, where, where the hell, uh, you can, you can, are we, are we tweeting? We're not tweeting yet. We're still working on it. Uh, we're going to get there. Yeah, we're working yeah, on it. Yeah, we're not, we're not, we're not big tweeters. YouTube. So, um, what? YouTube. You can find us on YouTube. You can find us on YouTube at the Retro Gamers. Well, you're watching us now. If you want to watch us. <laughs> I, if you're watching us right now, then you are, you're already there. So thank you. Um, but you can check us out on YouTube and, uh, you may be able to, at this point, check us out on Twitch as well. Uh, TRG underscore podcast um we will be uh we will be uh live streaming on twitch either we already are or we're moving forward to doing that <laughs> all right and more importantly if you are someone you know is listening to this right now and you guys are struggling with suicide addiction self-harm or depression please reach out Suicide is currently the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. There are 129 suicides that take place each and every day. And when you scale back internationally, there are 800,000 successful suicides. That's one death every 40 seconds. So if you or someone you know is struggling, you guys can reach out to us on any of our social medias at uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. You guys can call the Suicide Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255. Text HELP to 741-741 or go to victimsandvillains.net forward slash hope where you guys can get even more resources past the ones that I've just mentioned. And you guys can also find us everywhere at Victims and Villains, the social media that I just gave. You guys can like, follow, and subscribe to us on Twitch spotify apple Podcasts, wherever you guys get your podcasts from let us know what you guys what side you guys go with nintendo sega until next time remember to keep talking nerd talking hope speaking nothing else